Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrea Friedman, and I'm proud to serve as the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Ottawa and as your MC for tonight's program. It's a testament to the impact of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Sihono Livraha, that so many people made time this evening to mark the Shloshim of his passing. Welcome to everyone. To begin, a few thank yous to Rabbi Bolka, Rabbi Michael Berg, and Rabbi Sher for their assistance in conceptualizing and framing tonight's program. To my stellar Federation colleagues, Pauline Colwin, Sarah Butel, and Tanya Poirier for all their hard and creative work. And of course, to our featured speakers, of which we'll hear more about shortly, thank you all. Inspired by the teaching of Rabbi Sachs, our evening of learning and remembrance will focus on specific themes and also on personal reflections. To begin, we have two very special videos for you. The first is a montage of personal reflections from local Ottawa rabbis. And this will be immediately followed by award-winning author and scholar at George Washington University, Dr. Erica Brown. Rabbi Sachs was able to find the relevance in the stories of the Torah to our daily lives. He told the narratives in the most beautiful way and showed us the possibilities for a better and brighter future for ourselves and for all of humanity. I was introduced to Rabbi Sachs on a service mission to El Salvador with rabbis of a host of denominations. Together we studied a dignity of difference and it brought us together in the most remarkable ways. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was the quintessential chief rabbi and his ability to clarify and to deliver a message of Torah and Torah observance. In 1991, Rabbi Sachs taught all of us that there are many great Jewish leaders, but very few great Jewish followers. I hope in the years to come to be a great Jewish follower of Rabbi Sachs's example. I'm personally devastated by the loss of a great Torah teacher, an ambassador of Judaism and for the Jewish people, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, all of a shalom. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs never lost that, that, that sensitive touch. Despite being brilliant, and he was very brilliant, he knew that people need acknowledgement, people need warmth, people need love. I include Rabbi Sachs in almost all my sermons. I especially love how he saw Judaism as a religion of sacred discontent, challenging us not to accept the world as it is, but rather to keep working to make it better. Zichonot Sadik Libracha. As a pulpit rabbi, I am indeed grateful to Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs for his brilliance. He managed to take the timeless message of Torah, make it relevant and practical. His legacy will continue to live through his Torah thoughts and teachings. When I think of Rabbi Sachs, I think of a spiritual leader whose impact and influence reached far beyond the religious community with which he immediately identified, both within the Jewish world and far beyond as well. Because Rabbi Sachs brought the timeless lessons of our faith to humanity in a way that is so relevant, inspiring us to aspire for more, to think deeper and live in our lives more meaningfully. I met Lord Jonathan Sachs when he was just Rabbi Sachs. I taught at a program in Jews College in 1988 and in 1989 I became his master's student and uh, he supervised my master's thesis. So I had a front seat watching him as he began his meteoric rise which eventuated in the chief rabbinate and then becoming informally after he left that post the chief rabbi of the English speaking Jewish world. He was a mesmerizing teacher, demanding, gallant, charismatic. Um, with the front seat during those early and influential years, I observed how he addressed the public with warmth and depth, and then he turned inward, turning private input into public output on major world trends. In the Talmud, 
there's a lengthy passage that details the losses society suffers upon the death of certain sages. When Rabbi Meir died, the composers of fables ceased. When Ben Azai died, diligent students disappeared. When Rabbi Akiva died, the glory of the Torah ceased. Um, and although the Talmud abounds in Guzma, the sentiment is understandable. When a sage dies, some part of the world dies. And as a student, when Rabbi Sachs died, some part of me felt shattered, feels shattered, and knows that the world will never be the same without his wisdom, his genius, his brilliance, his compassion, his kindness, his capacity to bring us all in and call us all friends. Dr. Brown, thank you. As always, our rabbis are so inspiring and so impressive and so united in Jewish Ottawa. We are truly fortunate. You make us proud each and every day. It's now my great pleasure and honor to introduce Rabbi Dr. Reuven Bolka, Rabbi Emeritus of Congregation Masiki Hadass, uh, Federation's annual, uh, uh, Federation's current annual campaign co-chair and a personal friend of Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi, can you unmute yourself? I can't unmute you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I began by saying thank you everyone for being part of this tonight. Thank you the organizers. Thank you the participants. And, and thank you for those who are uh, joining us uh, by one virtually, but really realistically we're all together in this um, unanticipated tragedy that befell our community about a month ago. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, begin the way Rabbi Sachs usually began any of his speeches by telling a little bit of a joke. It'll be tasteful though. Um, the story is told of, uh, uh, of a fellow uh, who um, had a reputation his name was Albert Einstein. People may have heard of him. Uh, he had a reputation for loving children. And uh, one day uh, he was fixing his house and, and he had some uh, concrete being laid at the beginning of the house around where, the, uh, where, where the, there was a little bit of grass. And um, what happened then was one of the kids came stomping and ruined the entire concrete by stomping on it. And um, Albert Einstein apparently got very angry at the, uh, at the child. And he, he was so badly uh, hurt by it, he went back to his mother. His mother went back then to Albert Einstein and said, Mr. Einstein, or Dr. Einstein, or Professor Einstein, or whatever, you have a reputation for loving children. Uh, how could you do that to my child? And, and he reputedly said to her, to her, you are right, I love children in the abstract, but not in the concrete. This was um, an, Einstein, uh, an Einstein retort uh, that reminded me a lot of uh, Lord Sachs. He loved stories like this and he uh, also loved everyone. Not only abstract, he also loved them in the concrete. Uh, he was somebody who uh, loved the entire Jewish community. There was no holdback for him, uh, everyone. And actually, if you want to expand a little further, he loved humankind. And he had a wonderful philosophy about our obligation to make the world a better place. And he never, de uh, he never deterred from, from doing that. And uh, we are so fortunate. It's hard to believe that he's not with us anymore. Uh, I uh, go backwards to some of the uh, uh, some of the things, the memories that we have of uh, of, of of the good Lord. Um, uh, he uh, was uh, someone who uh, was an incredible combination of so many talents and abilities. Uh, it's hard to think of anyone who was able in in a, in a, in a life to be a phenomenally adept translator, which is not an easy thing to do, a innovative philosopher, which is also not easy to do, 
uh, and also to be a, um, a wonderful lecturer. And we know that sometimes the uh, most intellectual of lecturers can be very boring. Not him. There was nothing any nothing boring about him. He was he was the full package. And uh, if you scratch your heads, um, it's very hard to find anyone in our generation who is his equal, uh, who is able to combine all of these talents, and and to make our world such a better better place uh, because of it. He was uh, a gift to humankind uh, that um, we were fortunate to benefit from. Thanks to printed word and, and filmed word, uh, his ideas will be with us for, for eternity. However, he won't be here. And that's the big loss because he, as, as he was passing away, unfortunately, uh, he was also working on so many other things and expanding his his uh, wonderful insights into Judaism uh, and uh, in an incredible way. Uh, it's hard to believe that one individual could have touched so many lives in so many ways and written so many wonderful books, uh, which for each one of their own is a gem. Uh, I uh, hope and pray that his memory will continue to inspire us. And um, let me um, uh, perhaps um, ease into uh, my, my concluding remarks by telling you another story about uh, dear Jonathan, who was uh, a really uh, wonderful wit. Uh, partly a story goes that uh, he was once invited to in, in a gathering at uh, 10 Downing Street for uh, uh, with the Prime Minister, uh, John Major, I think it was at the time. And uh, he was at, asked to do the grace the benediction at the beginning. And then um, <clears throat> the problem was that they didn't put any food out. So how you not gonna, how you be able to say your grace without having any food at the table? So what he did is his usual quick thinking, he scanned the room and he saw that there were some grapes uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a table uh, and he took a grape and he made uh, a brocha on the grape. Instead of saying boy priyagofa and he said, or a prior eight, but a brocha is a brocha, a blessing is a blessing. And he was able to share that. Uh, and afterwards he remarked to, uh, to the prime minister, he says that uh, he complimented him. He said, look, you guys are much better than us. We insist that we can't say the blessing unless we have the food right in front of us. But your faith is so good that even though there's nothing on the table, you have no problem reciting a brocha. Uh, this is a Jonathan at his best, uh, making people feel good, uh, complimenting them. Uh, he, he was an individual uh, who, uh, no matter how many compliments you throw at him, uh, it's never enough because his life, his life dedicated to the Jewish community in so many different ways. And there was so much more that was still in the offing. And we lament, we lament his loss we, we are so grateful for the life that he lived, that it was a life of dedication to all of us, to Claudius Royal. And I hope that his blessing will continue to um, abound and abide by all of us for many, many more years, decades, and centuries. Um, I'm, I'm now also very honored to, uh, to present a very dear friend uh, who was a great admirer of, Dr. of Rabbi Sachs, who actually was the first one who sent me a condolence note after he passed away to the Archbishop, uh, Terence Prendergast, the Archbishop of Ottawa, and uh, um, recently also um, his, uh, his Archbishop's uh, mandate went a little bit beyond that, uh, beyond Ottawa, uh, Cornwall too. Um, a, tr a great friend of Israel, a great friend of the Jewish community, um, a uh, a, a devoted individual, soon becoming Archbishop Emeritus, and uh, my honor to present him to share his reminiscence about uh, Rabbi Sachs. I want to greet all of you who are watching this uh, presentation tonight about our Rabbi Sachs, Jonathan Sachs from the UK. Uh, I regret that uh, because of my retirement, 
uh, in, in early December and uh, the installation of my new uh, Archbishop of Ottawa, Cornwall, uh, Bishop Dan Fuss, it's at the same time as this meeting, so I've re recorded a few thoughts. I wanted to begin by saying that uh, for me, Jewish-Christian dialogue has always been important. In uh, Toronto, uh, when I was uh, beginning my work as a teacher at the University of Toronto and teaching seminarians and uh, future priests, I um, was asked by Cardinal Carter to accept his appointment of me to the Christian Jewish Dialogue of Toronto. That uh, relationship changed my relationship with the Jewish community. Uh, for 12 years, I was uh, heavily engaged with uh, members of the Jewish community in Toronto, other Christians, in dialoguing about how conflict has arisen among our communities and how it's important to resolve that by working towards reconciliation and peace. And I've always striven to do that in my own life, in my own ministry. Um, shortly after I went to uh, Halifax, I discovered that the one of the major synagogues in town was just down the street from my residence. And uh, a friend of mine from Poland who was involved in Christian Jewish dialogue, Jewish Christian dialogue, invited me to go on the Sabbath, which was just after Good Friday. And the rabbi and the community were very moved by my presence there. I simply went in to be a visitor and to take part as I could. But that friendship has been there and it's also a, a friendship I developed in, uh, in Ottawa with uh, Rabbi Polka. Uh, he's invited me to take part in his uh, kindness week and kindness activities and uh, sharing with him sometimes uh, news releases and uh, joint statements by religious leaders with the Muslim community here in Ottawa. And so what you're doing tonight is very important and I, I, I applaud it. I never met Rabbi Sachs, but I heard of him and I would often read of him on websites and uh, statements that he had made and I was always very touched. I, I, I thought there was something there in common that we shared. Uh, I, 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 I found myself in agreement most of the times with what he said. Uh, because he was in the UK and uh, not here in Canada, although he came to the States a number of times. Uh, I had to really deal with him in secondary causes, but as soon as he died, I, I shared with Bishop Rabbi Bolka my, my appreciation for him, and he asked me if I would say a few words. Uh, even though I didn't meet him, I feel somehow rather I've lost a friend or a fellow feeler, and I know the Jewish community has lost a great leader, and humanity has lost an eloquent spokesman. May he rest in peace in, in God's way, in God's hands, in God's uh, life. Rabbi Sachs was the most eloquent proponent of some of the greatest truths of humanity, so often forgotten. His forceful persuasive presentations of the truths expressed in Judaism, and indeed in the Christian faith, were truths which help us to make sense of our lives, our communities, our destinies. For example, on the occasion of the visit of Pope Benedict XVI to the UK, where Rabbi Sachs met the Holy Father at St. Mary's University during the visit, Lord Sachs said what led to secularization was that people lost faith in the ability of people of faith to live peacefully together. We must never go down that road again. It's a wonderful statement. We must never go down that road again. We need to live peaceably together. John Henry Newman uh, often said we should never ever conduct ourselves towards our humanity as if he were one day to be our friend. And I think that was the motivation for Rabbi Sachs's life and service. Lord Sachs' words on that occasion noted that in the face of a deeply individualistic culture, we offer community. Against consumerism, we talk about the things we have in value, but not a price. Against cynicism, we dare to admire and respect. In the face of the frank bending of families, we believe in consecrated relationships. We believe in marriage as a commitment, parenthood as a responsibility, in the poetry of everyday life. When it is etched in homes and schools within the charisma of holiness and grace. What would a bishop not want to agree with on that? It's beautiful. Lord Sachs' latest book, which I look forward to reading soon, Morality Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times, was published in March of this year. It resonated with many in our own Catholic community and others outside as well as within his own Jewish community. He said the coronavirus is going to test our capacity to work for the benefit of others. Selfishness is not going to protect us. 
he wrote the beautiful thing about morality is that it begins with us. You do not need to wait for a great political leader or an up upturn in the economy or a new mood in society or an unexpected technological breakthrough to begin to change the moral climate within which we live and move and have our being. Well, those words are find an echo in my heart. I hope they find an echo in yours, those of you who are participating in this session this evening. I pray that this may be a, a great event to celebrate a wonderful man, a wonderful human being, a wonderful religious leader. And I pray that uh, his values may find an echo in our society here in Ottawa. All the very best. Thank you, Archbishop, and thank you, Rabbi Bolka. Similar to Rabbi Sachs, both of you do so much to help make the world a better place. And for that, we all benefit, and we're all very grateful. It's now my pleasure to introduce Sivan Rahav Meir, an Israeli journalist, respected commentator on the Torah, and the current world Mizrahi Shlicha to North America. As it's the middle of the night right now in Israel, uh, Sivan has taken the liberty of pre-recording her remarks. Hello, shalom to the Jewish community of Ottawa. Shalom from Yerushalayim. It's Ivan Rav Meir. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that opportunity to participate from Yerushalayim, to be part of that important evening commemorating Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zichron Olivracha. I want to share two stories about the way he used to learn Torah and how it affected me, my life, the way I learn, the way I try to teach. The first story is well known, but in a way, it affected me because it's, it's different than my, my story completely. I grew up here in Israel, secular, non-observant. Non I uh, knew, I would say, I don't want to say I knew nothing. Uh, I didn't know enough about, enough about my Jewish heritage. At the age of 15, I first met someone who was religious, someone who was Shomer Shabbat, observant. There were three religious girls. They invited me to come to see what Shabbat is all about. And I fell in love. I became uh, more close, closer to our heritage, slowly. But I kept on working as a journalist. I thought I'm an objective journalist. It has nothing to do with Judaism. I'm just a journalist covering the reality in Israel. I started at a very young age being a journalist as a child here in Israel. And I continued. I thought that's the way, that's the path. And now I want to keep Shabbat or keep Kashrut. I want to be closer uh, to my heritage. But it means nothing when it comes to the professional side of my life. And that it worked for 10 years. Uh, but at the end of the day, I realized, no, it should affect what I do. It should be part of my agenda, of what I cover, of what I say as a journalist. And that story really changed the way I, uh, I work until today. I heard this story when I first heard about Rabbi Sachs, the professor, the lord, the well-known speaker. And everything started back then. Uh, when a young student entered the Lubavitcher Rebbe's office, he entered with uh, dozens of questions he had. He had a list of questions he wanted to ask the Rebbe about Judaism, about the situation of the world. He had many questions, question marks. But then the Rebbe changed the equation, started starting asking him questions. He said, excuse me, how many Jews are there in the campus where, where you learn? Uh, the young student Zachs had no idea. Uh, what do you do about them? How do you plan to make them more involved, engaged? Rabbi Sachs had no answer. The Rabbi said, okay, maybe you should give me answers about the Jewish uh, commitment uh, that you share with your colleagues there. And Rabbi Sachs stayed there for a few months, I think, in Brooklyn, at 770, Eastern Parkway, New York. He learned more. He became a Rav. And then he says, um, for years, he thought, that when you change, I would say, the equation, change the priorities, when Judaism is at the top, that's the center of your attention, everything else is in a way easier. In the academic field, philosophical field, he became well known, he, he achieved so many dreams, but Judaism was, I think, the first uh, uh, center of, I would say, concern for him. And that story, you know, I imagined the young student uh, thinking of being a lawyer maybe, Accountant, he had many dreams about the economy, finance, all kinds of dreams and fields and things he wanted to learn. But the rabbi told him, wait a minute, 
if you have skills, if you're talented, if you have the ability, the first thing is Judaism. What do you do about it? And in a way, I imagined the Rebbe's eyes, he always uh, uh, described the uh, Rebbe's eyes. I imagine myself standing there, the Rebbe looking at me, asking me, what do you do as a journalist, as an Israeli, as an um, uh, Orthodox woman today? What do you do? All you do is, you know, covering the Knesset, the parliament, there's a lot to cover. All you do is, you know, speaking about the, the elections, three elections in one year, COVID-19 now, lockdown, reopening, that's all. No, use the gifts Hashem gave you to do more. And that message made me much more involved. And I realized I shouldn't be as smart as him. I mean, we cannot all be professors, uh, rabbis, uh, intellectuals, philosophers, no. But whoever you are, um, it doesn't matter how much you know. It matters if you want to affect other people's lives, if you want to teach them, that's enough. It's your mission, it's your goal, it's your task, it's your shlichut. And in a way, that story changed the things I do. I still cover Israeli politics, a lot to cover, Baruch Hashem, but I also try to cover the Parsha, the weekly portion we read, as an item to create the you know, have more rating. That's, you know, what I do for years. Now I want to use the same tools I have, okay? Um, that ability to attract people, to ask uh, fascinating questions about the Parsha, to make them realize, to make them understand it's part of our mutual pulse. It's our mutual treasure. We should all cherish it and know it and learn it. That's what I try to do according to his legacy, according to that story. What do you do? with? And I think now, after... Uh, he passed away. This is our responsibility. This is our obligation to think, to rethink about our commitment. We should all be in a way shlichim. You shouldn't be, the rabbi didn't tell him, be a chabad, shli a chabad. No, be a shaliach wherever you are because we, we were all sent here, sent in a way of shlichim. Nishlachnu, in order to do something in this world, especially now facing that crisis, we're all shlichim. So that's the first story that changed the way I do things. And I also try, I saw the way he uses new media, technology, social media. I also try to do it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., WhatsApp, whatever. You take that message and you want to make it more available, more accessible. You want to make it short, but not superficial. You want to make it, uh, in a way, something that you can all understand. doesn't matter who you are and how much you know, but it's still uh, something respectful, something interesting, something intellectual. That's, I think, once again, the mutual challenge to make Judaism much more attractive. And uh, now the mission is even bigger after uh, he passed away. So that's the first story that made me rethink about my career, my job, what I do as a Jew. The second part, uh, I would say, it's not a story. I think it's, it's a moment, you know, uh, that in a way helped me shape uh, what I do uh, here in Israel. And I also try to do it around the, around the world. Um, it was a dark night here in Yerushalayim. I left the Knesset, the parliament, uh, uh, right here in front of uh, the window here in Yerushalayim. I covered the Knesset. I was the correspondent. I covered what was going on there back then. And it was quite frustrating. They were fighting. I, I, don't, I don't even remember the details of that rule, of that law. It was something about Shabbat, Kashrut, something about religion and state. And in a way, one could say, oh, she covered Shabbat. She covered um, Kashrut today. No, I covered a political dispute, conflict. Um, I covered, you know, coalition, opposition. That's, I didn't cover the essence of what Shabbat is all about, what Kashrut is all about. What is this mitzvah? What's the purpose? What's the meaning? What's the message? No, I just cover, you know, current events. That wasn't the real thing. I walked out, you know, I had some time to, you know, I was... Uh, watching, I don't know, uh, something on the feed. And I remember I saw one of Rabbi Sachs' lectures, and I remember I realized it shouldn't be that way. You can see Judaism in a broader way. It's important. The struggles in the Knesset, uh, very challenging things are going on there, and it's important. Judaism, the Jewish, I would say, identity of the Jewish state, that's very important. It's crucial. But maybe I have a different shlichut, because I watched him whenever he spoke, and he was in a way above those conflicts, above those definitions, sectors, streams. You, 
I guess we all have an, our identity. We all have our definitions. And one could say, okay, Rabbi Sachs was a very liberal philosopher, intellectual um, professor. Yeah. Is that the right way to define him? No. He was a devoted Jew who cared about other Jews, Jews who, and he wanted to teach Judaism. That was the main uh, goal. Yeah. He had other definitions too. I have my views. You have your own. I think we spend, I think we waste too much time discussing those tiny uh, details, those minor nuances. You know, I saw it because last year we spent almost a year in the States as world Mizrahi Shlichim. And I was shocked to see the same thing copy paste from Israel to the state. Here in Israel, you have more to the right and more to the left. Light and Chardal, Haredi and Sioni. And in, in the States, the same thing, the same game. Oh no, he's, he's open, he's closed. He's to the right, he's to the left. In a way, I saw American Jews there in their bubble discussing those, you know, inside their chunt, discussing their, uh, or shtetl or shtibl, uh, my Yiddish is not so good, but discussing their, you know, and they have conflicts and they write articles and then they respond and they have, you know, it's fascinating, but it's not important enough. I mean, we can't waste so much energy, time, money, efforts in those issues because we have a much, I would say, um, uh, important problem uh, uh, right now, assimilation. I think Rabbi Sachs realized he saw that problem in front of him. He couldn't ignore that problem and that's why he ignored all other problems. He could really spend so much time discussing um, Zionism, you know, um, uh, uh, and arguing, I don't know, with the Satmers, uh, Hasidim, Hasidei Satmer, or feminism. It's, uh, I guess he had his uh, ideology. Or uh, religion and science. There are so many issues. They're all very interesting, but nothing is more important now than assimilation. They all walk away, he used to say. They walk away. They disappear. We need to save them. We need to save us. We need to reach out to them. That's the main mission, to find those Jews outside of our bubble. They're not here with us. They're not to the right. They're not to the left. They know nothing. No Hebrew, no Jewish knowledge, nothing. We should be there for them. We should seek and search and find them. And that was his life mission. I think in a way, I remember that night walking out from the Knesset, saying to myself, and Baruch Hashem, now when I look back, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was a success. I want to leave those small nuances. I want to touch the big problem of assimilation, of Jewish identity, of Jewish heritage. It's much more urgent. And I think in a way, once again, now, after the Shloshim, it's our responsibility. I, I know in your community, even though it's a small community, sometimes in smaller communities, you have bigger problems. I know you can describe and you can, you know, deal with the differences between you. But if you're already here watching me, part of the community, already involved, please ignore it just for a, a while and go out there. Find the Jews who couldn't care less and uh, make them uh, into Jews who do care. Todah Rabba, those are my two messages, my two stories from Israel. Besorot tovot, yeshuot v'nechamot, Yerushalayim. Thank you so much for your wisdom, Sivan, and for reminding and empowering each of us that we are all shlichim and that each of us can make a difference in the lives of others. A very important message. Our keynote speaker this evening is the Honorable Erwin Kotler, a retired Canadian politician, emeritus professor of law, and founder and chair of the Ruhl Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. He was an MP for many years and served as the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Just last month, he was named Special Envoy for Holocaust Remembrance and the Fight Against Anti-Semitism, which is fitting as he, is, as he has been an icon fighting for human rights alongside his wife, Ariella, for decades. The Honorable Erwin Kotler. Thank you, Andrea, and may I begin by expressing my appreciation to Rabbi Bulka and the Ottawa Rabbinic Leadership uh, Andrea, to you and the Federation for organizing this evening of remembrance. I have found the presentations as moving as they have been instructive. The passing of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs was, and on the occasion of his Shloshim remains, a personal and profound loss. A profound loss for the Jewish people, 
and for humanity. It is akin to the passing of a Lamed Vavnik, which as legend has it, are the 36 righteous people living in the world. These just lives at any given moment redeem humanity. That is how I always felt about Rabbi Sachs. My mentor, teacher, role model, inspiration, and friend. Indeed, the Jewish people's collective inspirational role model. The inspirational role model for humanity as a whole. As Rabbi Bulka put it, a gift to humanity. Rabbi Sachs, in his own unique and inimitable way, framed seven principles of Jewish leadership. Anchored in an appreciation of the classics on leadership from the West to the East, but which principles are distinguishably anchored in Jewish faith, in Jewish history, in Jewish learning, in Judaism. As I've been asked to speak about Jewish leadership, I felt the best I could do would be to go to Rabbi Sachs himself and speak to his seven principles of Jewish leadership. The first, as he put it, is the notion of leadership as avdut, as sherut, as service, mentioned 18 times in the Tanakh in reference to Moshe as servant of the Lord, and which underscores also the importance of humility. The humility is the highest virtue of leadership. Rabbi Sachs was the embodiment of service L'shem Shemayim, and he was a model of humility in the best tradition of Moshe. Second, leadership begins, as Rabbi Sachs would remind us again and again, by taking responsibility, not deferring it, not deflecting it, Take it respon taking responsibility by action, not refraining from acting. Rabbi Sachs uses the opening chapter of Breshit of Genesis as an example of the failure of responsibility. Confronted by God with their sin, Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, and Ken says, am I my brother's keeper? Hashomer achi anochi. This is to be contrasted with Moshe's taking responsibility. When he sees an Egyptian beating an Israeli, he intervenes. When he sees shepherds abusing the daughters of Yitro, he intervenes. He was the model of Shomer Achi Anochi. I am my brother's and sister's keeper. And leadership, as Rabbi Sachs put it, is taking responsibility and acting, acting with others, engaging to right a wrong. As Rabbi Sachs put it, we cannot lead alone. Leadership is teamsmanship. And this was another unique leadership trait demonstrated by Rabbi Sachs, to exercise leadership in concert with others, as he led fellow parliamentarians, faith leaders, scholars, public intellectuals, students in calling out anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom and beyond. The third is leadership as being vision driven. Imen chazon yipora am. If there is no vision, the people will perish. It is vision, as Rabbi Sachs put it, that unites, that mobilizes, that inspires. Not the office, not the power, not the title, not the authority. And what distinguished Rabbi Sachs was his incredible visionary leadership. A visionary leadership which inspired us and reminded us that, to paraphrase also Bernard Shaw, some people see things as they are and ask why. Others see things as they may be and ask why not. The fourth, for Rabbi Sachs, the highest form of leadership was teaching, was chinuch. All three leadership roles in biblical Israel, kings, priests, and prophets, had a teaching mission. Moshe became Moshe Rabbeinu, and leadership was ongoing learning, less leadership lack depth, lack direction. As Rabbi Sachs put it, study, learning, lil mod, lil amed, that distinguishes the statesman from the ordinary politician. And Rabbi Sachs 
was a transformative statesman, a leader who never stopped learning, who never stopped teaching. The fifth is that the leader must have faith in the people they lead. High-handed, authoritarian, arrogant leadership is the antithesis of leadership. Rabbi Sachs trusted and respected his fellow rabbis, his congregants, his constituents, his interfaith leaders, his fellow academics and students, and he believed strongly in the notion of mikom lamdai hiskalti, that I have learned from everybody that I have met. Number six, that leadership needs a sense of timing and pace. A leader must lead from the front, but he must not be too far in front. As Rabbi Sachs put it, go too fast and people resist. Go too slow and people become complacent. And transformative, consequential leadership takes time. Lo alecham lachalig mor. ben chorin li batel mana. It is not incumbent upon you to complete the work, but you cannot desist from beginning it. And finally, as Rabbi Sachs again would not only teach us, but in fact would exemplify that we are all summoned to the task of leadership. We are all partners in Mamlachet Kohanim Vagoy Kadosh. And where in that sense, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazah, we are each, wherever we are, the guarantors of each other's destiny, as we are each wherever we are, responsible one for another. That is what Jewish leadership is all about. And we, each of us, from wherever we are, can be those leaders. That is Rabbi Sachs's great message of inspiration, great message of faith and hope for all. We can all be partners in taking responsibility. We can all be partners in being Jewish leaders. We can all be partners in being anchored in the best of Jewish values, Jewish heritage, and Jewish vision. Thank you. Erwin, thank you. My, my, my only regret in your remarks tonight is that Rabbi Sachs only had seven principles because I could learn and listen to you um, all night. Um, your words are always brilliant, inspiring, eloquent, and the world is just really lucky that you've chosen the path that you have in life, helping to make a better world for us all. So thank you so very much. This concludes our formal program. And on behalf of Federation, I thank everyone here tonight for helping to honor and to remember Rabbi Sachs. May his memory continue to be a blessing. Thank you, Lila Tov, and good night. <laughs>